Morning everybody, David Shapiro here with your weekly video. So today we're going to talk about the data flywheel, the number one concept you need to know in the age of AI. Right off the bat, what is a data flywheel? In short, the concept of the data flywheel is a simple virtuous cycle whereby you have users and you use those users to get more data. You use that data to get better AI. You use that better AI to get better products and services, which in turn gets you more users and more data and so on and so forth. And on into infinity, you get compounding returns and exponential growth. So um, I had to make this own my own graphic because I think most of the ones out there are probably copyrighted and I didn't want my video to get taken down. But if you just Google image search data flywheel, you'll see what I'm talking about. There's plenty of good articles out there. But let's dive right in. Okay, so history of the flywheel. Turns out that flywheels are actually like super old, like 8,000 years old. Um, most of the time they're used for pottery wheels, sharpening sticks and stones. But basically it's this little bit down here, that heavy stone, right? And so what you do is you spin it and it holds some of that energy and it'll keep spinning. And you add more and more energy and it speeds up over time. So that's kind of where it started. Uh, but the concept of the flywheel applies today uh, just as much as ever. So flywheels are part of engines, uh, particularly uh, large diesel engines, but also uh, flywheels are really important for things like race cars, uh, pretty much any electromechanical device uh, or chemical mechanical device because it smooths out the performance and, and helps conserve some of that rotational energy, some of that power. But in all cases, they start at zero and they have to speed up. You can even uh, have really big flywheels act as generators for when you lose power. So, all right, so now you know what a flywheel is. Electromechanical device or chemical mechanical device that stores rotational energy. I'm sure you don't care about the physics of it. Where did the data flywheel begin? Um, so apparently the whole thing was pitched to Jeff Bezos back in 2003 by Jim Collins. Um, and then, of course, everyone's familiar with the Silicon Valley, or are they in Silicon Valley? Anyways, the, the, the tech darling of Amazon, right? Jeff Bezos has obviously been incredibly successful, um, and Amazon has pioneered and championed all sorts of innovative things such as agile, microservices, continuous deployment, continuous improvement. The data flywheel idea is one of the foundational principles of Amazon's success which is, I, I don't understand why no, pe more people don't know that. That's why I'm making this video, so now you know. Um, okay, so generative AI is basically a fire hose of data. Every inference that you send to uh, GPT-3, GPT-4, uh, for image generation, every single thing that you send and get back is more data. It's literally just a data producer. It's a fire hose of data. And so you should record every single inference or generation for LLM, uh, uh, image generators, everything. Save it all. Save the input, the output, the context, the metadata, the parameters, everything. So there is so much data going on here. And this is above and beyond the existing data that you get from like, um, your insights and telemetry from uh, from your applications and web, right? Because everyone by now is familiar with the fact that like, uh, you know, uh, linger time, time on page, uh, all those other uh, data points are available through things. But now you have even more data, which is your product is more directly related to your data, your products and services. So there's lots and lots and lots of data to consume already but then there's even more data to consume in the age of generative AI. So how did I use this? So I use this to go from 20,000 subscribers at the beginning of this year to over 50,000 subscribers right now. So I more than doubled my subscriber base in just a few months. Now, obviously some of that is algorithmic luck, right? Some of that was, I noticed a trend and I made use of it, um, but that was consuming the data. So let me tell you how. It wasn't entirely on accident. For those of you who don't know, YouTube gives you uh, a dashboard for creators and some of the information that it gives you, it's, it tells you one, which of your videos are doing best over time. It tells you which uh, channels and other videos are leading to yours. So you can see, okay, who are my, 
peers and competitors. I don't really think of it as a competitive landscape because usually users want more of the content that you give them. So it's more like peers, right? We're all offering similar, similar content. It's like a buffet. Um, so I was like, okay, so they're, they're doing this, they're doing that. Um, and there's a lot of information that you can consume above and beyond what the dashboard gives you. So there is a service out there called vidIQ, which I tried and I didn't like it. Um, I didn't, I didn't go for the paid tier, but I was just like, I saw, like, I was looking at the dashboard and I was like, oh, they're obviously using like an LLM to generate some recommendations. I was like, I can do better than this. So what I did was I took the transcripts from my own videos and I compared that with the comments that I was getting. So I, 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 I took the transcript and comments and I said, what about my videos is resonating with my users? And so I used chat GPT to distill down and said, okay, this is what people like. This is why, and then I use those insights to generate um, ideas for follow-up videos and to really kind of shape my narrative and delivery, and it worked. I got from 20,000 subs to 50,000 subs in just a couple months. That was uh, how I really kind of nailed the algorithm by using this uh, data flywheel because more users, more subscribers meant that I got more data, right? And the data in this case was in the form of comments, but also the, the numerical telemetry, right? Because you put out more videos, you see which videos resonate, which ones don't. And I feed that into the AI, in this case, ChatGBT, which led to better videos, better transcripts or you know, scripts, which led to more users. Um, so that's just, I did it by hand, right? Didn't ha uh, just manual copying and pasting of, of raw data into chat GPT. Obviously this is not the most sophisticated or sustainable model, but it's just an example of how easy it is to get started with the data flywheel. So with this concept of the data flywheel, the goal, the business goal is compounding returns, the positive feedback loop, the virtuous cycle, or most conventionally the snowball effect because the more subscribers you have, the better reach you have, the more data you've got. And that's just for YouTube. This applies to every business out there, whether it's for your marketing team, your product team, everything. So how can businesses do this? Obviously not everyone out there is a YouTube creator. So you're like, Dave, come on, get on with the show. So there's a few rules of thumb um, out there. So one, record everything. If you're not recording your data, you need to be recording it. And not just the output from the models, you need to record what goes in and out because that's how you're going to um, get the feedback later. You also need to record the metadata, the metadata, the context, and the parameters because uh, that information will be critical with, for making sense of the data later on. Number two, you need to actually use the data. There are so many companies out there that have a lot of data that they just never even look at. So then they're spending money on storage and backups and they're not using it. You might as well just delete the data if you're not going to use it. Um, and number three, and this is the hardest part, is make changes. Pretty dashboards and charts and graphs don't mean a damn thing if you don't actually change your behaviors. So sometimes that means you need to say, hey, like this email campaign didn't work. Let's just stop doing it. Or you know, we're, we're totally missing out on this sector. We need to go after that sector. Um, you can change your outward behavior, which is how you engage with the market and your customers. You can also change your internal behavior. So in the age of language technology, that can be changing how you run and use meetings. It can change. It can be how you, uh, use Jira and Slack and teams and all that stuff. So you have to change your behaviors, your rules, your structures, change the system, right? And if you don't do that, if you're not, if you if you just consume the data and look at it, but then don't make any changes, again, you might as well just delete it. And I'll tell you why that's the worst decision you can make in just a minute. And number four, iterate. You're not going to get this right the first time, right? You're going to experiment. You're going to have a lot of uh, of uh, false starts, a lot of damp squibs that just it just doesn't hit. But then when you do nail the algorithm, you'll go, you'll do what I did, which is go from 20,000 subs to 50,000 subs in just a couple months. And that's, that's honestly the dream of every tech product out there, right? That's what chat GPT did. They kept iterating on GPT technology until they found the version chat GPT that went to hundred million users in a couple of months. All right, so I'm talking about iteration and all this other stuff and data flywheels, and you've probably never heard about either of these things, but the good news is 
For all you business types out there, there are a few frameworks out there that you can just go read about and hire a consultant and uh, and say, hey, I want to improve my business processes, both internally, externally, uh, customer, product, whatever. Um, and you say, I want to do this from a data-centric perspective because this is the age of AI. So first one is Agile. Agile is a software uh, development thing which focuses on tight feedback loops. Uh, so that is Agile is how you can do the data flywheel uh, for your, your software teams. Kaizen is about um, uh, iterative improvement more broadly across your whole business. Six Sigma is a very similar thing where it, it focuses on reducing defects um, and, and flaws in the process. And then finally, ITIL, the uh, IT infrastructure library, um, is about uh, service process improvement internally. So all of these, read a book or two on it, you'll see the common thing. The, what these all have in common is rapid feedback loops. And those feedback loops are often human-based processes. But there's no reason that you can't start adding more data and consuming that data with AI to get that feedback and make those behavior changes. All right, so I know some of you guys are hot on the biscuit to get going. So for all you business chads out there, like cool your britches for a second. So while a data flywheel is really critical, like if you wanna survive in the age of AI, you absolutely 100% need a data flywheel. I guarantee you that 80% uh, or 90% of the businesses that fail in the age of AI won't have a data flywheel. That being said, this, isn't, this alone isn't going to save you, right? Um, doing the, if you say like, hey, we need to do a data flywheel before you even have a product, you're missing the point. You need a decent enough product or service first to prime the pump, right? If you, if you look at that graphic where you start with more users, right? I've already got users on my YouTube channel. I earned that the hard way, right? If your product doesn't have any users, data flywheel isn't going to matter because remember the data flywheel it's based on inertia it's based on momentum if it's sitting there inert it's actually going to slow you down more um it's not a, it's not a shiny new toy it is nice but as a business person you shouldn't even be thinking about it once it gets set up let your teams handle it because they're going to be the ones to to know how to do it um most importantly that concept all these philosophies of iterative improvements start with executive leadership if you don't buy in on a, on a visceral level and understand process improvement and iterative improvement at an executive level, it doesn't matter. You might as well not even do it. All right. So in order to really power up, obviously, eventually you're going to want really fat, fat data pipelines to feed your uh, flywheel, right? There's a few mantras that you can adopt, and this is for executives all the way down to engineers and product owners and architects. Data is the new oil. It baffles me how few people have heard this term in the age of generative AI. Data is the new oil. Um, live it, learn it, embody it, embrace it. Think about it. Talk about it. Another one is slow is smooth, smooth is fast. This is the idea of kickstarting your data flywheel slowly at first. Remember, it's a big, heavy thing, right? All your products, all your services, all your data, it's really cumbersome. You're not going to light this fire real fast. You got to start slow. That'll be smooth. But the idea is that it cranks up over time, right? It starts accelerating. Garbage in, garbage out. For those of you who are not familiar with machine learning and data science, if you feed it a bunch of garbage data, you're going to get a lot of garbage results. So don't put pressure to say, like, we need to consume all of our data. I know that I said record all your data. That doesn't mean consume all your data, right? You have a big pile of data. You need to figure out which signals to pay attention to. And that goes to the last thing, which is what gets measured gets managed. This actually comes from uh, ITIL. So ITIL talks about things like, uh, manage your uh, your time to resolution, your mean your MTTX, mean time to resolution, and a few other things in your uh, IT uh, service portal. Same thing can happen for customers, right? Whether it's an internal customer or external customer. How long does it take to satisfy customer demand? How much does it cost you? Uh, those kinds of things. If you're not measuring the right things, you're completely blind. And this these are all some of the mantras. This is not an exhaustive list. But these are some of the mantras that can go into building that mentality of the data flywheel. So in the age of AI, 
uh, being where oil is the new data, stop hemorrhaging your data or your oil, because then you're just losing money. It's money out the door. And that's all there is to it, I believe. Yes, that's the end of the video. All right. Thanks for watching.